whenever you think of them. And we and I will be asking them of Chloe at the end of her talk. So anytime you want to put questions in the chat. And I think that's all the introduction to the webinar. Um, I hope you enjoy it. And I'm just going to pass it over to Chloe because she'll do a better job than me at in introducing herself. Really excited to have her. Thanks for being with us, Chloe. Thank you so much, Julia, and thank you everyone for joining tonight. I'm excited to be in the virtual here with you. Um, for those who don't know me, my name is Chloe Maxman. I'm a state senator representing Senate District 13, which is all of Lincoln County except for Dresden plus Washington and Windsor, a total of 27 towns in the beautiful mid coast. Uh, I served a term in the House before serving in the Senate. I represented House District 88, which was Chelsea, Whitefield, Jefferson, and half of Nobleboro. And um, Tonight, I'm going to be telling you my story, which all revolves around the theme of building up a new politics for rural America. I grew up in Nobleboro, and I, I just, I love it here. And I, um, I think that a lot of politics, especially democratic politics, have left behind rural communities. So that's what I'm going to be talking about. Um, a few disclaimers before I dig in. First, I'm, I'm going to share my sl some slides with you so you can see photos instead of just looking at my face for half an hour. But um, my slides are awful. I'm really bad at graphic design, so please forgive me. Um, another one of my disclaimers is that I'm going to talk a, like a little bit more about what's happened in the past and what I'm doing right now um, because they're kind of more formative than what I'm doing right now, although I'll definitely talk about um, what's going on in Augusta. Uh, but the main theme of what I'm talking about is organizing. So when I talk about high school or college, that's the vein that I mean it in. Um, I learned all the skills that I put to use in our campaigns in college. So um, I wanted to share some of those stories because um, I never knew I was going to be in elected office. And I think most young folks don't see themselves in elected office. And I want so I wanted to kind of share that that story and that path. Um, the third thing that I wanted to say before I start is that, um, you know, in my community, I don't care about party. Um, there are people who voted for me and who voted for Trump. The people who raised me are Republicans. I don't care. I care about, are you a good person? Are you a good neighbor? Do we show up for each other? And that's why our campaigns have focused on values and not party. Um, that being said, I do there's something that happens when people are elected and they go into spaces like Augusta or you know what happens in Congress where party politics becomes very real and very divisive. And um, and I'm a, I'm a Democrat because my values lie in equal access and opportunity, but um, I'm not a Democrat because I believe in party politics. So I just wanna say that because I'm talking about democratic politics, but that's not to exclude Republicans or the Republicans who are part of my life. Um, it's just to say that within the party structure, we're leaving behind a lot of people. And um, and I think some of the stuff happening at the national level and sometimes at the state level with the Republican party, I don't agree with. So um, just won't put that out there because I'm not being exclusionary. I'm just uh, trying to find a way through this mess. So let me share my screen with you and get started. Okay, there we go. So um, this is a picture of the main House of Representatives. Uh, it's the day that we got sworn in in 2018 when I was first elected. And I, I share this picture because this is a space that I now identify with, I'm part of it. But before I was part of it, I spent the vast majority of my life being incredibly angry at it. I was angry at the past that it represented. I was angry at the people inside it. I felt like the whole system represented a failure of representation and that um, it wasn't listening to people. We weren't living in a representative democracy anymore. We elected people who disappeared and never listened to their constituents. And it seemed like no matter how hard I tried with communities that I was part of to influence this system that it never worked. Um, and there just seemed to be a lack of courage and backbone in these spaces. And so um, I never thought I would find myself there and had lived most of my life with great antipathy for politics. Um, 
backing up a couple decades, I uh, grew up on my family's farm in Nobleboro and uh, everything I do is because I love Maine. I love, I love Nobleboro. I love my community. I love how I grew up, where I grew up. I can't tear myself away from Maine. Uh, Julie and I were just talking before about how we, um, we left Maine for a little bit, but I, I came right back and I, I haven't wanted to leave since. Um, and so since I love Maine so much, I started to become acutely aware of threats to Maine at some point in my development. And um, the first threat was this proposal to uh, develop the woods around Moosehead Lake. Um, some folks may remember that from a very long time ago, but that was my first in, my first into organizing and my first into trying to make change, I guess. And it really stuck with me. I went to Lincoln Academy for high school and I started the Climate Action Club there. The Climate Action Club is still in existence today, which is pretty cool. Um, uh, let's see, I started in 2007, so you can do that math. Um, my high school math skills are not as sharp as they once used to be. So uh, yeah, the Climate Action Club was an incredible experience for me. Looking back, some of the things that we did were pretty basic. Um, we got uh, the buses to stop idling. We did a lot of work to stop using re uh, plastic bags and get more reusable bags across town. We did a whole bunch of stuff. We were the first school in Maine, as far as I know, to install solar panels without any government aid. Those panels are still on Lincoln's roof today. Um, and so what we did was basic, but to me, it was extraordinary because I had no idea that uh, you know, a small group of young folks could actually make a difference. That was not a message that I had heard growing up um, and just kind of stumbled into it because I was um, just trying to fight for Maine and keep our keep our home beautiful. And so that's where I learned the power of some people coming together to try and do something good. Um, and that stuck with me as well. Um, so the next thing that happened was that I went to Harvard for college and during my first year at Harvard, I was sitting in my dorm one night and I learned about this thing called the Trailbreaker Pipeline. It's an old pipeline that uh, crisscrosses New England, as you can see on the bottom right. It used to carry crude oil from Portland up to Canada, but there was a proposal to reverse the flow of this pipeline and bring tar sands um, from Alberta across Canada and down through New England into Casco Bay uh, for a variety of reasons. This was an awful idea, not only because of climate change, but because of very real threats to public health, um, public safety, and drinking water. So um, that following summer, I worked with the Maine Sierra Club to document this pipeline and start working with Mainers and other folks in New England to do something about it. Um, this, so the top left photo is I was driving around with um, Andy Burt. I bet a lot of you know her. And uh, this is a farm that we came across. And that yellow pole is where this pipeline is. You know, tar sands was going to run through this very old pipeline right by this beautiful field. And um, I was like, this is such a hidden thing. What is going on here? And then I learned that ExxonMobil owns 76% of this pipeline. And um, that's a fact that I clearly remember to this day because I had no idea um, growing up in Nobleboro, maybe, maybe naive and sheltered, but I didn't know that the fossil fuel industry had a hold in Maine. Um, and I happened to be going to Harvard at the time. This was at the same moment that the fossil fuel divestment movement was picking up steam across the country. So I went back to Harvard a couple months later and I started divest Harvard to try and get Harvard to stop investing in fossil fuels because I didn't want my university to be investing in a corporation that was threatening Maine. The same themes repeated over and over. Um, you know, and I came into Harvard knowing that I cared about environmental issues, the Climate Action Club and the youth work was still fresh in my mind. And so divest Harvard was the next step. Um, Harvard is pretty popular. Everyone knows what it is. It also has the largest endowment of any institution on planet Earth. It's $40 billion. Um, that's a lot of money, clearly. And uh, Harvard does not invest it wisely, or I guess, should we say morally? Uh, I won't even go into that because it makes me so angry that so much privilege and money is just squandered and put into bad stuff. But 
um, we use Divest Harvard um, for as a way to uh, build a movement on campus around climate change and around the fossil fuel industry. Um, more specifically, we were really trying to draw attention to how the fossil fuel industry is obstructing climate policy on the national level um, and the state level. We were thinking um, if we can get these big institutions to divest from fossil fuels, we're sending a, a signal across the universe that we can't associate with the Exxons and Shells and BPs of the world anymore. Maybe uh, politicians will stop taking contributions from them, and maybe that will create space for the people to have their voices heard. So let's use divestment as a tool to do that. Um, so it was a political tactic, um, at least it was for me. So. Um, so we began to organize and I knew a little bit about organizing from high school, but not a whole lot. So um, Divest Harvard is where I learned to organize and so genuinely where all the so many of the tactics from our campaigns um, in Maine came from. The first thing that we did was just talk to folks and educate the student body. We had a vote on divestment. 72% of students supported it. First divestment vote in the world. Um, we started to figure out how to just like build it up, you know, trial and error. Um, you obviously see a uh, canyon written on here. Uh, I don't mean the Grand Canyon. I mean this young man named Canyon. He's going to appear in a lot of pictures from here on out. We met at Harvard uh, organizing together and he was my campaign manager for both of my campaigns. And so um, he's in here just to show you what a journey we've been on together and he's as much a part of everything I'm talking about as I am so I want his presence to be known. So, you know, we had we held rallies and uh, educational forums and we protested and we did different actions and we were clearly getting a lot of momentum with the student body, but the administration didn't care. So um, we kept going. We ended up, um, you know, this kind of classic escalation strategy in organizing where you just come getting bigger and bigger and bigger. Um, we ended up blockading our president's office building for just about 24 hours, which are the folks, the photos that you see here. Um, and during this time, there was a petition supporting us that went viral. So by the end of our 24 hours, um, less than two years into our campaign, between all the students, faculty, and alumni we had talked to, plus this community petition, we had over 70,000 people um, on board with Divest Harvard. Um, one of our own was arrested for the first time since the Vietnam War protests at Harvard. So bad. The administration still didn't care, but we kept going. We fasted. We literally sued Harvard. We did another sit-in. Um, you can see Canyon right there. We did this thing called Harvard Heat Week, where we shut down the university's administrative buildings for an entire week, six days and six nights. We slept outside. Um, all the administrators were working out of Starbucks instead of their offices. Um, and just some of these photos just show you the incredible turnout that we had, um, and this was less than three years after Divest Harvard had started, you know, so um, our model of talking to people, educating folks, meeting people where they're at, creating lots of opportunities for engagement, lots of actions, it all led to this, and that was an incredible experience in movement building. But there was something that always bothered me about organizing around divestment. Um, like I said before, it was a political tactic. We were trying to create political space for people to elect good people who are going to get good policy going on climate change. But no matter how much power divestment was building or how many people marched in the streets, we weren't really building political power. You know, there were 200,000 people marching in the streets um, in these years, but then Donald Trump was elected. And so um, there was a huge gap there. And that's what I wrote my thesis on. And oops, I didn't mean to go to that slide next. Um, so I wrote that, the I wrote my thesis on it and came back to Maine the day after I graduated from Harvard to start thinking about um, how do we build a politics that actually has political power? And why is it so, you know, why are we so weak in the political realm, but so strong 
in the movement realm. These were the questions that I was thinking about. So I moved back to Nobleboro. I was working a bunch of random jobs as we do in Maine, um, but also finding my way into working on different campaigns, doing different organizing, um, just trying to see what was out there and what was working and what wasn't. But then um, in 2016, Donald Trump was elected and that was a really, I mean, that was a big moment for a lot of people, but it was a really big moment for me because um, I, I, again, I, I have a lot of folks who voted for me and voted for Trump and that is 100% fine, I don't care, um, but I did not vote for Trump and a lot of his policies um, did trouble me. So um, I looked at the results and what I saw were a couple things. One is that um, rural areas overwhelmingly voted for Trump. Uh, my House district and my Senate district at the state level voted for Trump. You know, it, it's too simplistic to say that the rural vote elected Trump, but the rural vote had a huge part in electing Trump, um, clearly displaying its political power. The other thing in 2016 that was becoming clearer and clearer is that um, Republicans were taking over state legislatures across the country and and um, putting forward agendas that were not good, you know, anti health care, anti education, um, just bad, just not stuff that I don't agree with. And, um, and so that really made me think about rural local politics. Um, and, you know, I realized I grew up in one of these red house districts I, that voted for Trump. I grew up in a red Senate district that voted for Trump. And maybe my way of making change was actually more about me running for office. Um, so here are just some statistics to back up what I just said. So uh, the Democrats lost 968 state legislative seats during Obama's presidency leading up to 2016, um, the largest net loss since World War II, which is pretty crazy. Um, when you look at the map of the 2016 election results, oop, that should be a comma instead of a period there, sorry. But the greatest support for Trump came from small rural towns like mine. Uh, from 1999 to 2009, neither party had a significant advantage amongst rural voters. Um, but today, Republicans have a 16% advantage in rural communities. So um, something's happening with the Democrats in rural places, uh, which is like a whole nother long saga that I don't necessarily have to get into right now. But um, they're kind of to blame for this too. Uh, and this quote from Tom Perez kind of sums it up, who says you can't door knock in rural America. So, um, so all of these facts were floating through my mind and I decided to run for a state representative in District 88 in my hometown of Nobleboro. Um, yeah, okay. So a little bit about District 88. Um, District 88 had never been won by a Democrat before. It had a 16%, uh, a negative 16% Democratic performance index. So um, basically Republicans win as much in District 88 as they do um, in rural communities on average across the nation. Um, a lot of interesting dynamics here too. I mean, we're all from the area, so we know uh, Maine is the most rural county, sorry, Maine is the most rural state in the country and Lincoln County is tied with Piscataquis as the most rural county in Maine. Maine is also the oldest state in the country and Lincoln County is the oldest state in Maine, sorry, the oldest county in Maine. I was just looking at some recent data. Um, Lincoln Senate District 13 has more folks on Medicare than any other Senate district in the state. So a um, lot of stuff happening here. Uh, so we set off to the task of campaigning and I convinced Canyon to move to Nobleboro to manage the campaign. And uh, we embarked on this semi impossible task together with one thing in mind, which is that we were gonna do everything differently. We knew that Democrats were losing in rural communities. We knew that Democrats were losing at the local level. We knew that the whole democratic apparatus was not working for rural communities. Canyon grew up in a rural red community as well. And these are the places that we call home. And um, yet our party and some of the communities we belong to were just completely leaving them behind. And that was not okay with us. So we wanted to do it all differently and we had no idea if it would work or not, but 
we thought, why not try? So um, we started to organize. We literally would map out all the things that we learned from organizing with Divest Harvard and we brought them to rural Maine. So um, when I talked about actions and talking with people and bringing folks together, that's what you see in this photo. We would have these canvas days um, where we would rent out the North Nobleboro Community Center, have music and food, and folks would go out and canvas for a couple hours together and then come back and we would have more music and food. Um, a lot of the folks in this photo and these photos had never canvassed before. They're my friends from Portland, from high school, from college, uh, people who I met while I was knocking doors. Um, I had a primary too. So when I filed to run, there was already a Democrat, uh, Mr. Alan Plummer, who had filed to run. So we first had to win over the Democrats to win the primary before we went to the general. Uh, we started doing house parties. I started canvassing when it was still snowing outside in February. Um, canvassing in rural places is so different than canvassing in a city. Um, but we were proving Tom Perez wrong that you can door knock in rural America. Um, we just started to talk to a lot of people. Um, another thing that we did, uh, and this is still all in the primary phase, is we did our own training. So um, I don't know if all of you have been able to help out on a campaign before, but uh, I have, and it's been awful. I got, you know, like sent off by myself to talk to people who had already been talked to three or four times, got doors slammed in my face came back, got the world's worst cookie, and I went home feeling like I had just wasted half my day. Um, got very little training, felt like it was totally useless, and we didn't want our volunteers to feel that way. So um, we did it all ourselves. You know, we really talked to people um, about how to knock on a door. You know, you're not just there to see if someone's going to support Chloe or not. You're there to have a conversation, to listen and to learn and to really take the time to hear what's going on. So we did all of our own trainings um, and we won our primary with 80% of the vote. Uh, we exceeded record turnout by 40%. A lot of the local town offices ran out of ballots. Um, we turned out a lot of people to vote. Okay, so then after the primary, I started to talk to Republicans and independents. We needed, um, in order to win District 88, we needed 80% of Democrats to vote for us, plus 60% of Republicans and independents. So, um, that was a huge lift in a in a pretty conservative district. Only 27% of District 88 um, are registered Democrats. So I spent from June 2018 to November 2018 um, talking to folks who weren't in my party. And this experience completely changed my life and how I look at organizing. Um, the pattern that I noticed happened to me multiple times a day, every single day. And um, these photo show what I mean. So I'll walk you through it. Um, I use a thing called minivan to canvas. It you know brings up someone's address. Um, and you can also see if someone has been contacted before by a Democratic campaign or a Democratic canvasser. Um, and that would appear under survey question history. So you can see on the left too that uh, those folks have never been contacted by a Democratic campaign candidate, canvasser, volunteer in their entire voting history, um, but they voted for us. The person in the middle hadn't been contacted since 2008, and the person on the far right um, had been contacted recently, marked as too Republican, but we went and talked to them and they supported us. So we started to notice this pattern, this deep pattern of disenfranchisement of folks genuinely being left out. When I when I started knocking, I thought the biggest issues I would hear would be healthcare and education or, you know, how how awful our local roads are. Um, but that's not what I heard the most. The the theme that was most prevalent was that government has abandoned us and failed us. We do not feel heard. Um, and when I started canvassing, it was no wonder. Um, it's kind of heartbreaking, you know. Um, and I really, I felt like I was just creating such incredible relationships with people. And I really didn't want those relationships to feel transactional or like I was just showing up once and being like, 
hey, I'm Chloe, will you vote for me? And then they'd be like, cool, or I don't know. And I would say goodbye, never see them again. So um, my commitment to myself as a candidate was to canvas a lot. For our primary, I made, um, I attempted to find people eight times. For the general, I attempted to find people four times, just because there's more people um, for the general. So I can't go back eight times. But um, so you can see how these are different people who were never home, but I kept going back and back to try and find them, you know, leaving my little thing, my little flyer there each time. Um, and so all of this came together and we won with 52.4% of the vote. We won by 219 votes, which um, is not a whole lot, but it's still pretty incredible for the uh, task that we had taken up. And uh, going into Augusta, I felt really passionate about representing my community and representing all of those voices that had been so left out. Um, so I sponsored four bills. They all came directly from conversations that I had with folks. These are just some random pictures of me doing Augusta stuff. Um, every single month since I've been elected um, and continuing right now, I've done coffee with Chloe so that folks have a space to come and chat with me and share ideas and all that kind of stuff. And I just try and be as uh, responsive and accountable as I possibly can be in this role. Um, so the, the two years kind of went by doing stuff in Augusta and the opportunity came, came up to run for state Senate. Um, and this was a really big decision. A lot of people ask me why I decided to run for the state Senate instead of staying in the state house seat. And um, as I've said so much to me, um, the importance of building a new politics revolves all around movement building and talking to people. And the best time to do that is during a campaign season. That's when we can go knock on doors and really dig into the issues and reach beyond the choir. Uh, and the opportunity to do that on a larger level was so deeply exciting to me. Uh, the state Senate district is about six times bigger than a house district. So it's uh, significantly more area. The House districts are 9,000 people and the Senate districts are around 38,000 people. So a lot more people, a lot more area. And I really wanted to, to build a movement, but also on some level to show that all of the, the skills that we had put into our 2018 campaign could be replicated, that they weren't just something to be isolated in a small, tiny house district in the middle of Maine, but something that was really important to starting a new conversation about rural politics in um, purple or red leaning places. And so that was my mission, um, running for state Senate and, um, and of course, to represent my community. So um, District 13, like I said, um, is almost all of Lincoln County, except for poor Dresden, but Eloise Vitelli and Allison Hepler have Dresden. They're in good hands. Um, when Before we even started campaigning, the Hill had identified Lincoln County as one of the 10 counties that would decide the 2020 election because it's almost a third, a third, a third Republican, Democratic, Independent. And uh, so such an interesting dynamic there. Um, this this Senate district voted for Trump in 2016, but it voted for Collins and Biden in 2020. Um, we were going up against Dana Dow, who was the highest ranking Republican in the state at the time. I'm sure you all know Dow Furniture. That's him. Um, he was a Senate minority leader. He had never lost a general general election. He'd been um, in and out of office for almost 20 years. He won by less than 400 votes in 2018. Um, and we actually won by 800 votes this year. That number um, was before all the data came in. Um, the other interesting fact that I just learned is that a party leader hadn't been ousted in Maine since 1992. So um, as is kind of classic with my personality, we took on a huge challenge, but the journey is way more important than the outcome. And we put all of our skills and all of our tools to the test. So some of this is gonna be redundant, but we started off um, right before COVID hit with a huge potluck at the North Nobleboro Community Center, just starting our movement off right um, with lots of food and music and fun and community and just making it a really warm space for folks, you know, not one of those awful political things that you drag yourself to. Um, it was really beautiful. And uh, after that, I started door knocking, you know, we were, it was still January, so no one was as into it as I was, but 
a couple months later, COVID hit and we immediately put our campaign on pause. But, uh, you know, we realized that there were tons of people in our community who were really scared and probably needed help. So um, we started to build a movement again to try and address that. We put out the call for phone bankers and um, we started to call seniors in our community and ask if they needed anything. We offered access to food, pharmacy pickups, a ride to the doctor, social support, just someone to call in every now and then, um, and really any other requests that people could have. And um, this effort just completely took off. These are some uh, snapshots of our Zoom phone banking. We had 200 volunteers sign up just for our COVID phone banking. We ended up calling over 13,500 seniors. Um, and it was incredible. I mean, we provided support for hundreds of people um, who needed a ride or whatever it was. Um, and just some beautiful stories came out of this network that we created. Um, to us, it was really important to show that politics can be good, it can be used as a public service, and it's not all self serving. Um, and this network still continues to this day, which is which is crazy. I mean, COVID is obviously still all around us. And um, I am consistently arranging rides for folks who can't get to the doctor, who get stuck at miles and need a ride home. Um, this network is still is still very much ongoing and um, just a testament to our campaign and the kind of ethic that we brought to it. Um, but eventually we needed to start campaigning again. And so we eased back into that pretty gently. Um, we did softer things like letters to the editor. We had, um, I'll get to the numbers later, but we did a lot of letters to the editor. We um, did a lot of hand-painted signs as well. That's something that we did in 2018 and we did even more this year. The, um, the Maxman Please one is my high school history teacher, Mr. Omani, who put that one up. Um, and some of you may have seen these beautiful signs peppered all across the district. They were so beautiful and we loved them so much, just bringing a different feel to our work. Um, we tried to, we did a lot of gatherings, you know, we tried to do as much community building as we could, giving, given the restrictions of COVID. Um, the district is so big, so with our organizer minds, we divided it up into four different quadrants and had regional gatherings in each one. And, you know, so people were organizing with their own community instead of someone in Windsor organizing with someone in Booth Bay. Um, that didn't make a whole lot of sense. So, um, really cool way to build up community in COVID. We had some um, bone banks distanced as well. So we did, this is one at the Booth Bay Brewery that we did with them. Um, and these are two interns that worked with me this summer, just trying to figure out the creative ways to get through campaigning in COVID. Um, this, is an, this is our intern Jasper, who was doing distance sign painting with a bunch of folks at Natasha Mayer's house in Whitefield. Um, the Lincoln County Democrats did an incredible drive in for democracy. The work that the Lincoln County Dems do, by the way, is amazing. I have so much respect for them. Definitely would not have won either time without them. They are awesome and deserve all your support and love. Um, we also just tried to be, uh, you know, just like really out there and making connections that might surprise people. Um, so kind of obviously we committed to run a 100% campaign just with all of the Collins Gideon noise. It was so awful. I couldn't even stand it. And this is my line of work. And so, um, there was never a negative word coming from our campaign. We only focused on our vision and what we could do together. We were endorsed by Todd Brackett, who's the Lincoln County Sheriff and an incredible human being. He does so much work for our community. We were also endorsed by Les Fossil, the former chair of the Lincoln County Republicans and a former Republican state senator from this area. So just trying to um, create this messaging and narrative that was a little different. We also um, did all of our own graphic design in 2018 and 2020. We didn't uh, use any of the party resources. I should have mentioned that before, but you know, we didn't um, get a canvassing universe from the party. We didn't use any of their consultants, our mailers, our flyers, everything you saw, we did ourselves. Um, and we saved a lot of money, um, a lot of taxpayer money by doing it that way as well. Um, but most importantly, I knocked on a lot of doors in 2020. I did it really safely, um, very, very safely, and my volunteers did not do it. Um, 
but you know this is what my knuckles looked like every day i would knock um at least 100 doors a day from june until november just talking with so many people about what was going on in our community and what was happening to our political system um, also making so many unlikely friends. I There were a lot of Trump signs next to Chloe signs this year, but I always felt so awkward taking a picture of them because I like didn't want people to feel weird. I did manage to sneak this one. This is the only usable one I could find. Um, but just trying to show you that our, our movement and our campaign um, really did transcend party and was so focused on on values and just helping each other. I mean, this gentleman in particular, I had helped him, um, like he, was, he wasn't my constituent, but I had helped him with something and he was just so grateful and uh, ended up supporting me. And it was just incredible what can happen when you take the time to listen and to respect what you hear and just not react instantly. Um, so this is a little bit of a summary of what we did in 2020. It was a monumental effort. State Senate campaigns are such a different beast than a, than a House campaign. So in total, um, not including our COVID volunteers, we had 200 volunteers just for our campaign. We wrote over, um, we, everybody, wrote uh, 5, 000, over 5,000 handwritten postcards to voters in the district. We had over uh, 100 letters to the editor. We had um, our volunteers did lit drops, so just kind of uh, dropping our, our flyer on someone's porch and a tiny bit of canvassing. Um, so our volunteers ended up uh, going to 6,100 houses. I ended up knocking on 13,314 doors, which I am never doing again. Um, we did a lot of phone banking as well because COVID and we contacted 65,000 people. Our total voter contact is 86,486. We were the highest voter contact of any campaign in Maine. The second highest was um, Shanna Bellows' campaign that contacted 34,600 people. And again, we um, did our own graphics, our own mailers, and we created our own canvassing universe. And we won. Um, we won by 800 votes, uh, 51, by the time all of the votes came in, it was 51.1% um, of the vote. Uh, so not huge margins, but certainly more than Dana Dow won by in 2018. Um, it was incredible. There was election night was a wild, wild ride. There were times when we were um, ahead by four votes and then down by a hundred and it was just, it was insane. Um, but we, we did it and we were so incredibly proud. Um, and now I'm a state senator. So um, for folks who are interested in, in Augusta these days, we're doing our business out of the Civic Center, not every day. Uh, we're going back in March 10th and 11th for, for session. So the picture on the left is what the House of Representatives is looking like. And the picture on the right is uh, what the Senate looks like. So um, when we go back in in a couple weeks, that's those are the spaces that we're going to be in. And in between, we're in committee on Zoom. So um, this picture is not super interesting, but I'm on the Agriculture, Conservation, and Forestry Committee, and I'm also on the Marine Resources Committee. So um, for many hours a week, we're just um, listening to bills, doing public hearings and work sessions via Zoom. Um, for folks who like want to learn how to track bills or need help tracking bills, these are the um, the links that I use, and also the uh, link to the committee so you can follow their schedule. I'm happy to put that in the chat afterwards. Um, I also have 13 bills in this year. It was a coincidence that I put in 13 bills for District 13. They, um, they are a wide range of issues. Um, the top ones that I'm really excited about are a, constitu a constitutional amendment to the main constitution that would establish a right to clean air, clean water, and a healthy environment. That public hearing has been set for March 8th, I learned today. Um, I have a transportation bill in that's really trying to figure out a new model for transportation access in, in rural places. I also have open primaries in to make sure that independents can vote in a Republican or Democratic primary. And I have a big one in with the um, labor unions, a big green jobs bill that I'm really excited about. 
But um, you can see here, I'm also working on recovery community organizations, alternative sentencing programs, um, getting funding for the Francis Perkins Center, and a whole bunch of other stuff. So um, all those are coming out. Not all of them have been printed, but you can find them on my legislative page when they are. So I think um, that's the end of my spiel there. And I'm going to stop sharing my screen. And uh, so happy to dig into questions or comments about all of that. Thank you so much, Chloe. That was really fascinating and inspiring. And it amazes me to think of knocking on 100 doors a day for that many months. So <laughs> incredible. Um, thanks. So I, I'll just um, read out questions as they come in. There is one question and others are certainly welcome to type in your questions into the chat. So um, Gina Snyder says, all the energy, congratulations. How do you funnel that into action in government which moves so slowly? I'm reminded of Gina McCarthy when she said the ship of state is really like a ship and cannot change course very quickly. Mm. Both Gina said such good things. Um, yeah, you know, I in Augusta, there's the way that I look at it is there's the inside and the outside. So the inside is certainly very slow moving, and you know, almost every bill gets whittled down um, in some fashion or some kind of compromise. You know, as is as is probably obvious when 200 people are trying to make a decision about uh, five lines of of text. So. Um, it's not usually five lines, but just for the sake of argument. Uh, and so that I kind of have, I've made peace with that. I think the process is what it is on some level, and it's not a process that's built for dealing with massive urgent crisis, as we've seen with COVID, but it's doing its best. There's still outside work to do, though, you know, like getting people to pay attention to what's happening in Augusta, testifying, um, putting pressure on legislators, making constituents voices heard, and also, of course, um, doing a lot of work in the campaign season. So um, all of that stuff can move really quickly and be really empowering when because the outside, the goal, the metric, the goal is around um, people power and having people's voices heard. Where on the inside, it's more about how many votes are you going to get, and that's a, like a little less accessible, a lot less accessible, and um, just kind of blah in general, I find. But yeah, that's how I look at it. Thank you. Um, our next question is actually from another one of our future webinar speakers, uh, Amara Feji, who's going to be speaking in May. So I hope you all tune into that. But she says, Chloe, your work is incredibly inspiring for me as a youth looking to spark change. I was wondering if you could expand on how you've engaged youth in your organizing work. Um, hi, Amara. Amara is incredible. I'm so glad that she's going to be part of your speaker series. We were just doing a training before this for um, a group that we work with together called Just Me for Just Us. So um, yeah, go Amara. And uh, I, so yes, in 2018, I sponsored the Maine Green New Deal and did a lot of work to involve young folks in that process. And, uh, you know, I scheduled the, the public hearing for that bill on the same day as the Youth Day of Climate Action in Maine. So there were a lot of youth uh, protesting outside Augusta, and then they all came inside and testified at the public hearing. Um, it was an incredible hearing because uh, almost all the folks who testified were young folks or people from the labor union. And those are just two voices that you don't usually hear in committee spaces in Augusta. Um, and this year, you know, I, I work with a lot of young folks and just try and bring as many young folks into the conversation as I can. I know I'm working with, uh, I know I'm working on a bill with young folks this session, but my brain is a little tired and I can't think of it. Um, but yeah, I just really, young folks' voices are needed in Augusta so so desperately and try and make that happen whenever I can. Great, thanks. Um, we have a question from Peter Shiras. What did you learn in talking to so many people in your campaign and it, has it caused you to rethink any of your own beliefs and assumptions or to think differently about how you go about your work as a legislature, as legislator? Mm. Oh, that's such a good question. Um, Yes, it has so drastically changed how I am as a human being and how I legislate. I um, 
I mean, two things, the two big things I learned from my conversations are one, the importance of listening and respecting what you hear, that even if you disagree, that that's okay. Um, and you rarely disagree 100% with someone, you know, usually have some common ground with someone somewhere in the vast array of life. Um, you know, so I and I loved finding that common ground. I had some conversations with folks that um, were really hard, but also, you know, we ended on a good note. because it was like, oh, yeah, I go snowmobiling there. Or like, oh, yeah, I like ice fishing, too, or just whatever, whatever it may be. Um, so listening and respect. But I also heard how frustrated everyone is, like no matter who you vote for, or where you're from, every single person I talk to is frustrated with government and thinks that it's not serving them well. So that means when I go to Augusta, I don't want to replicate the patterns that I heard people are frustrated with. So I answer my phone and I answer my email. I'll meet with any constituent that wants to. Um, my voting record is not for me and reflecting all of my values, it's for my community. And so sometimes I vote for things that um, are not what the Democrats are voting for, but it's what my community needs, it's what's right for my community. And a kind of an adjacent point to that is that um, rural solutions and rural policies oftentimes can look a lot different than what um, the Democrats are putting forth because it's largely urban centric. And so I found I found myself not voting party line in Augusta at all because because um, the kind of access and flexibility that we need here is just so different. And, um, you know, so all to say, I'm not there for me. I'm there for you. It actually leads in well to another question. Um, from Marianne Nafe, who says, Chloe, so exciting to hear how you've been able to cross party lines in your district. Have you been able to use these skills in Augusta with success? Um, I would like to think that I have, um, you know, certainly in my first term, I, I, I felt like I made um, an a huge effort to to really talk with folks from the from the other side you know like we don't mingle that much um and i'm such a socially awkward person so it felt like a huge effort to me to just track someone down in the hallway or walk up to someone on the house floor and be like will you look at my bill um are you interested in it and um and i didn't see many other democrats doing that and so that felt like a lot to me um and also just for, for me taking the time to, to read bills on my own and not get the low down from the party caucus was really important as well. Um, and being able to run bills by folks in my community who who I knew had different perspectives than me was, was important as well, just kind of informed a different way of legislating. And um, this year it's different because we're not in person, so it's hard to have that, uh, like that face-to-face -face trusting conversation, but I have been, um, it's, it's easier for me too in my second term right now, but I have a lot of conversations with Republicans and um, we agree on lots of things and disagree on other things. And, um, you know, to me, I just am grateful that there's space for that conversation and um, have been doing that a lot, a lot. So yeah, that's how I look at it. Thanks. Um, another question on kind of a different topic um, from Gina again, do you see the Zoom connection continuing at the State House? It makes it so much more accessible to attend or listen to what's happening at meetings. I haven't heard any talk of that being taken away. I agree that the Zoom the Zoom testimony makes it so accessible. Um, just so everyone's on the same page, the previously pre-COVID, the only way to testify live was in person. So if you're like working like all of us do and or you don't live near Augusta, um, it's almost impossible to testify in person and it's all it's just so much better. So um, I would imagine that there will be a mix of in person testimony and zoom testimony. Um, and of course, the written testimony, at least that's what I would advocate for and do not want to see the zoom testimony get taken away. Um, there's a, a somewhat lengthy question, <laughs> which I will summarize. Um, so first, congratulations, Chloe from Whitefield. This is from Christy. Um, housing market is hot right now and two things seem to be happening. Or maybe I'll just read this. One is that folks who sell their homes are having a tough time finding new places to live with in Maine. The second is that a significant portion of people are moving into the state from other places 
possibly with expectations for services that exceed the ability of small communities to provide. So these challenge, pose challenges for rural residents. Have you had a chance to think about this? This is definitely something that I've been hearing about too. Mm, yeah, I've been thinking about this so much recently. Um, it's, it's obviously just a huge complex issue, um, kind of hard, hard to unpack, but on the housing front, I think that, um, yeah, the housing situation in Maine is is really tricky. And um, yeah, for renters and, and folks who are getting priced out of some of our communities, it's not, it's not a good situation. And there are a lot of conversations happening this session around housing access and housing justice for Mainers. And that's really important. Um, really important i yeah it's just i the example that's coming to mind is what's happening in booth bay harbor where folks are just like literally getting priced out of the places that they've grown up and uh it's really freaky to see that that kind of main slip away um from the people who made it and so i think about that a lot and then um and it, with re regards to the services yeah that's come up in so many conversations i've been having recently um especially um, Lincoln County with you know where it's kind of smush between um, Portland and then the and Bar Harbor and um, I'll put this in the chat later but the main Center for Economic Policy just released their data analysis for all the districts and it's really interesting because of all the um, northern Maine is a very different disenfranchised bucket but for um, kind of southern Maine and especially all the coastal communities we are a huge outlier you know in, in terms of uh, poverty food insecurity, folks on Medicaid and Medicare, unemployment. Um, it was really interesting to look at. We do lack these services and there is more demand for them. Um, and especially when we think about the opioid crisis and, and, and how that's playing out in a rural community that has very little resources. So um, I'll also say, I think about it a lot and you know certainly know so many folks who are working on it. And broadband is also a huge issue for folks who are moving here, but um, Yes, I was on a converse. I was talking with Holly Stover the other day, who represents the Booth Bay area, and she she called um, Lincoln County uh, resource poor, service poor. I think she said, which I um, which I really agree with. You know, yeah, we just and that's why we're classified as a really rural county, even though it feels different than up north, um, because we have lots of tiny towns and not lots of services, and so that's how the census looks at what rural means. So long-winded but yeah it's on my mind great does anyone else have any questions that they'd like to pose or comments oh. all right well i really appreciate you speaking with us chloe i'm glad that it worked out um for us to be able to have you i'm sure everyone else really enjoyed it too so i guess we will say good night yeah Good night. Thank you so much for having me. Yeah, thanks a lot. Take care. Bye.